It's Joe Spinson, so it's usually pretty solid, and this solo is certainly no exception. And it's from probably my favorite period of Benson, with a lot of bebop, high energy, and amazing phrasing, and also some really solid blues. Jazz guitar probably wouldn't be jazz guitar without this era of Benson's playing, and it's odd to think of that the first time I heard him play live, I nearly walked out of the concert, but I'll talk about that later. The solo is on a fairly basic blues in C with one twist in the harmony, and Benson's solo is, of course, mind-blowing. It even has a phrase that I can't analyze, or really make sense of, but it still sounds great. The theme is sort of built around a sound that I used to call expensive or sophisticated blues. Before we get into the solo and the mysterious phrases that I can analyze, let me just recommend this album. The track is off the album called The George Benson Cookbook, which is one of my favorite albums. This album and the one before it called It's Uptown are the same core band and are really just great examples of what George Benson did as a sideman before launching into a solo career. You definitely want to check both of them out. There's a lot to talk about already with the theme in this. Even if it isn't complicated, then it is about doing the simple things the right way to really make it perfect, both with rhythm, melody and harmony. This is really happening on quite a few levels, actually. Let's start with the main riff. Now, what I used to call expensive blues was when you had a solo that used the 6th or 13th together with the minor 3rd, which is something I usually found with B.B. King or Freddie King. And, of course, the inexpensive or cheap blues would be if you had just the minor pentatonic scale. The first part of the main riff is really just a trill with a blue note and then running down the scale ending on the A, so that expensive 6th or 13th. Now what makes this really work is that this riff is repeated, so first it starts on beat 1, but then the next time when it's repeated it's actually moved to beat 4, which means that it's sort of flipping around or turning around the beat, making it more interesting. So that starts here, and then there's a two beat pattern that sort of rounds the whole thing off. And that gives it sort of a three beats, three beats, two beat feel, which is kind of like a three two clave or what you might hear in sort of a New Orleans groove like Bo Diddley. The short tag at the ending of the riff is really just C major pentatonic with a leading note. And I think that's definitely something I want to drive home with this video because it is amazing how well all of this sounds with really simple things. That's what, that's what Benson really nails in this entire solo. The theme is super simple because it's of course just 12 bar blues and they're not even really changing anything when they go to the fourth degree. So they're just repeating that two bar riff on both the C7 and the F7 chords. And nothing changes until you get to bar nine and 10 where usually you would in a jazz blues have like D minor seven to G7. Here they're playing A flat seven to G7 with this. And then to have a send-off, because they're using this as an interlude as well, and they kind of want to give some energy to the soloist so that there's something to start with, then the turnaround is really just a bunch of upbeats, which of course in this tempo really creates a lot of energy and tension. And I think you can really hear how Benson is using that energy. So when he takes that one bar break to start his solo, it's go from the first note. <laughs> So really just stating the groove and the time and getting into it, keeping that energy going to really launch his solo. First connecting the sharp nine and the flat nine with a half step. And then a simple enclosure to take us to the third of C, because it's a pickup, you want to keep it clear, of course. So that's really stating like, this is beat one of the top of the chorus, it's clear where we are. And then he's running down this phrase, which is essentially just a triad line, so. Again, with a large interval at the end, so it's all super solid, sounds great, makes sense. It's actually not that complicated, but the next phrase is oddly complicated. There's a lot of stuff happening. I'm not 100% sure that that's actually on purpose. Check it out. So he gets out right, but that's, that's really a lot of half steps in there. There's also this really weird interval in the middle with which sounds kind of strange, but uh, if we just look at what's going on, most of it really makes sense, so, and the rest, I don't know. First, just the expensive note up to the root, so the A or the 13th up to C. Then we get something that still kind of works as if it's like a blues phrase. 
And then we get the weird interval, so uh, from A flat up to B, up to the root, and then it still kind of makes sense. And then it's just back to a bunch of half steps, so. And then he's rounding that off with some basic cymbal phrases on the F7. Of course, I could try and analyze this by calling it a uh, superimposed dominant or maybe a Barry Harris uh, six mini scale with a lot of extra half steps, but I think it's actually fine. I, I come across that more often when I'm transcribing solos. There will be places where you can't really tell what's going on. One thing that is important to point out with this is that the timing and the phrasing is still on point. Everything is solid. He doesn't sound like he's searching or that he's getting lost. Of course, I also forgot to mention that this track in is, is in fact called Benny's Back and uh, it's probably dedicated to the trombone player who's the featured guest soloist here, Benny Green. Let's get into some solid bebop phrases, but try to notice that he's actually playing fairly short lines for somebody who's very inspired by Bob. And I think it's really interesting because he really has sort of the Bob energy and I'm pretty sure he was very inspired by Pat Martino at this point in time. And it does have the Pat Martino vibe, so there's like that high energy, lots of picked notes, but he's playing quite differently in terms of having a lot of short phrases compared to having these longer lines and also probably more complicated lines that you find with Pat Martino. Another thing that I think is definitely worth noticing, mainly because I have to tell students this all the time, is that you hear that the phrases are almost never ending on a long note. He's almost always ending with a short note, almost what you would call staccato, so really just very short. A lot of solid bob stuff happening here. If you take a look at the line on the E half diminished A7, because there's a variation of that coming up later as well, that's definitely worth noticing. Then you have this. And of course, it's really simple. He's kind of just running down the scale, but then also still really connecting to that A7 and spelling that out and coming out on the third on the D minor chord. And on the D minor chord, he's using the arpeggio from the third, which is also worth noticing. Again, it's like a basic thing that you want to be able to do. So an F major seven, nine on the D minor seven, but it's also not rocket science. It's not really crazy what's going on. It just works and it's simple. I guess if I have to play a fingering for this one, I would probably do, but I don't think that's what he's doing. And then you get a lot of short phrases, again, connecting to the chord, and then some major pentatonic, and just to take us back to the next chorus, again, using this really, really simple G7 phrase, which is really just like a suspension and the root, and then just a C triad at the top of the next chorus. The next phrase is actually a lot of notes, but it's only a few different notes, and he's just playing them several times. So it's really about rhythm and phrasing. So what's happening here is really just about playing the same note, but then getting it to sound different, which in itself is of course interesting. So just playing one note per chord, and essentially the root most of the time, he's really just spelling out F7, moving to F sharp diminished, and then back to C7, which of course is also a common progression to have in a blues in C when you're on the fourth degree, moving back to uh, the one in bar six. Now I mentioned the E half diminished A7 because that will come back later in a variation, and uh, that's what we have now. So what we have here is of course just octave displacement being put to perfect use. The first time around the phrase was and now he's playing essentially the same phrase but he's changing octave in the middle of it so you get and then he's skipping up to make it more interesting and then of course this time around he ends up with a D7, he's not playing D minor at that point so he goes and really plays D minor, uh, sorry D major pentatonic and then using C blues on the G7 to create some tension, which is also a nice way of doing that, so. Now he's using D7 instead of D minor, which is actually fairly common. If you have seen my video on Joe Pass improvising over the blues, you can see that he does the same thing. 
But first, as I mentioned, then I nearly walked out of the concert the first time I went to see Josh Benson play live. Now, I was always completely blown away by Benson on stuff like this song and his solo on Billy's Bounce and all that straight ahead stuff. It's just incredible. His playing is so good on this. But obviously, he is by now much more popular as a singer and sits more in sort of the pop and smooth jazz segment of. Uh, of the genre, which is not really my thing. Now, the first time I heard him live, he was playing at the North Sea Jazz Festival when it was still here in The Hague. I was in my second year of conservatory and we just played at the festival with uh, the conservatory big band conducted by Jim McNeely. I was really looking forward to seeing him play. And he was in the big hall at the festival. And we went there and of course it was completely packed. So we had to stand far back in the hall. And I have to admit that in that concert, I was completely baffled and actually pretty disappointed that he didn't play guitar at all. He was only singing and after 30 minutes I kind of gave up and I was already beginning to make my way to the exit to go see something else when he finally picked up a guitar and played an amazing instrumental blues. The next and I think also last song luckily also had a guitar solo. In the end it was worth the wait but he nearly lost me. If you want to use syncopated rhythms just do stuff like this. So again, really simple. Essentially, he's just sort of doing a take on the, the take the A train ending, so. But of course, he's syncopating the rhythm a lot more and he's using the C as sort of a pedal point up there, so coming out on the root. It's rhythmically super interesting and of course it's also quite difficult to play a syncopated rhythm like that in this tempo. The real challenge with this phrase and also with some of the other phrases that you've seen is really that no amount of scales or complicated arpeggios are going to save you if you don't have interesting melodies or interesting rhythms. But maybe the tempo for this one is a bit fast to get started with working on this. And there is another jazz blues solo that is at a much slower tempo but which also is full of really solid perfect phrases both using bop and jazz blues, most of which are actually, again, pretty simple. And that's this Joe Pass solo that is off probably my favorite Joe Pass album. <laughs> 